Second Corinthians chapter three. The title of today's sermon is The Gospel of Grace is Truly Glorious. There's only a few verses here, but I decided to make it into two sermons. Simply because I, I, I think that we, we've got to study the background to what Paul is saying if we want to understand what he's teaching. We talk in our church in particular, we talk a lot about glorifying God, the glory of God, and yet it probably isn't well understood by us or by the church at large today. I wonder how much of what we do really glorifies God. If Jesus were here, not, not just, we're not talking about the singing, we're not talking about the offering, we're not talking about what we wear, but our very hearts, would we sing? Or are we hiding sin in our heart? Have we really come face to face with the glory of God and been changed by it? Stand with me and we'll you can follow along as I read 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. Now if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end. Will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to the end came with glory, how much more will what is permanent have glory? You can be seated. What was the theme word throughout these verses? Ah, you got it. You paid attention. The theme of these verses is the glory of God. But do we really get it? Do we understand what the glory of God is? The word glory, or in some translations, glorified, which is used twice. The word glory or glorified is used ten times in five verses. So even a guy like me can understand that if it's said ten times in five verses, it must be important. So the word glory means this, according to the Greek English lexicon in the New Testament, the quality of splendid, remarkable appearance. The quality of splendid, remarkable appearance. But I have to confess that doesn't help me understand glory much. The glory of God is throughout the scriptures. We see it. It's talked about. But there are five important times when the glory of God is revealed in the Old Covenant. And again, are there more times that it's revealed in the Old Testament and talked about? Yes. But there are five key times that it's talked about that we need to pay attention to if we're going to understand the text which we're studying out of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. First of all, Mount Sinai. We're going to look at the Old Testament. I hope you brought your Bibles. We're going to be turning to the Old Testament. But Mount Sinai, God's glory in the giving of the law. As Moses recaps the giving of the law in Deuteronomy, he's, he's giving kind of a, a history lesson to the people of Israel before he dies. And in Deuteronomy, he talks about the giving of the law. In Deuteronomy 5, 22 to 24, we read these words. Right after he tells them, this is what the law is, the Ten Commandments. 
these words the Lord spoke to all your assembly at the mountain out of the midst of the fire, the cloud, and the thick darkness with a loud voice, and he added no more. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. And as soon as you heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness, while the mountain was burning with fire, you came near to me, all the heads of your tribes and your elders, and you said, Behold, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. This day we have seen God speak with man, and man still live. I wonder, have you seen the glory of God? Have you experienced the glory of God? Because if you did, you would realize there's no reason you should breathe. Except by His grace. Mount Sinai, the giving of the Ten Commandments. It's also recorded in Exodus chapter 20. We'll be looking at that later on as we go through this series. Um, Exodus chapter 20 is the giving of the law as recorded by Moses right after it occurred. The second time that it's important for us to understand this glory of God being revealed is the tent of meeting. Now the tent of meeting is different than the tabernacle, though tabernacle is talked about for the tent of meeting. The tent of meeting originally was a tent put up where Moses met with God. God then later gave instructions for the building of the tabernacle, which inside it housed the new tent of meeting. So they're kind of interchangeable, but the tent of meeting is the what we're going to talk about is the very first one where Moses met with God. God's glory filled the tent as he met with Moses. Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 9. Verses 22 to 24. They've been presenting offerings before the Lord and, and Moses is about to meet with God in the tent of meeting. And in verses 22 and 24 says, Then Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them. And he came down from offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. And when they came out, they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the pieces of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. I wonder, have you seen the glory of God? Or has the Old Testament just come, become story time? And imagine the people of Israel coming out of Egypt, having just witnessed the ten plagues that decimated Egypt, each, the Egyptians driving them out, and their rebellion, God's judgment, but we, we find that God is so patient with them, and there's this tent that's put up by Moses. God chooses to meet with Moses on a regular basis in this place called the Tent of Meeting. And what we know as the Shekinah glory of God comes down in a pillar of smoke and fills that tent of meeting, and Moses is able to go in. And the scripture says, and he talked with Moses face to face as a friend talks with a friend. Have you met with God? When you read the scriptures, are you just reading words, checking off a list so you're not feeling guilty about not reading the Bible? Or when you read the scriptures, are you meeting with the God who is alive, whose glory is reflected in the words of scripture? Why 
why is Paul even referring back to this old covenant, the old law, the law, the letter of the law that kills that he says in verse 6 of chapter 3? It's because of the false accusations. These false teachers were coming in and they were putting Paul down as as a guy who's not fit to be teaching, as a guy who's not fit to be preaching, his words in paper, they're real bold, but when he's with us, he's just a coward. And they're running him down, and Paul's saying, no, 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 you don't understand. My ministry to you is a fulfillment of the prophecy of God and the completing of the old and the coming of the new. And he's saying, I've met with God, and I've seen His glory. And he talks about Moses and the giving of the law. The glory of God filled the tent as Yahweh met with Moses. But the third time we, we see the glory of God, and it's significant, is as Moses comes out of the tent of meeting or the tabernacle in Exodus chapter 34. Exodus 34 verses 29 and 30. In this case, what's happened is that God's given Moses the law, the people of sin. Now Moses goes back up onto the mountain. And, and notice, if, you, if you've got your scriptures open, notice back in chapter 33 of Exodus. What, what happens in chapter 33 is, we see in verse 11, Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, the young man, would not depart from the tent. I mean, why is Joshua the next leader? Because he was faithful to God. He was right there at the tent of meeting. Where, wherever Moses was, he was there. Wherever God was, he was there. And we, we find that Joshua loved the presence of God. But Moses broke those tablets when Israel sinned. And now the new ones have to be made. And God calls Moses back up onto the mountain and gives him the new commandments, the Ten Commandments again. And in verses 29 to 30, After God has said to Moses, hey, you know, why don't I just wipe out these people and I'll start all over with you. They're just stiff-necked, hard-hearted rebels and I know that you'll serve me. And Moses intercedes with God on behalf of the people, not because of the people, but because of the testimony of God who promised to make them into a nation. And Moses is concerned of what the nations might think if God actually brought the Israelites out and then destroyed them all when he promised to make them into a nation. So Moses is concerned about God's character, not the people. And God calls Moses back up onto the mountain, gives him the Ten Commandments again, renews the covenant with the people. And we find in verses 29 and 30 these words. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he was talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. I wonder, have you experienced the glory of God? Have you seen the glory of God? Well, better yet, yes, 
Is the glory of God reflected through you? The most holy place is the next one. The tabernacle is built. The most holy place is the meeting place of God. And in Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 to 38. Exodus 40, 34 to 38. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from the tap, from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set up. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, by day, and fire was on it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Now imagine this sight, if you will. What did you think that the experience of the giving of, of the law on Mount Sinai in the first place and, and seeing the awesomeness of the mountain and its fire and its smoke and its trembling and the loud trumpet calls and, and God's warning, don't even touch the mountain or you'll die. That that would have caused the people to fear and to worship God. But what did they do? In time, they got used to it. In time, it became mundane and ordinary. And in time, they get tired of waiting. And they went up to Aaron and they said, We need gods to take us back to Egypt. You make us some. Aaron then says, Okay, give me your earrings and your nose rings and all those, those gold jewelry that you have. And, and we'll see what happens when he forms the bull, the calf, for the Israelites to worship. And they break out into orgies and sexual immorality and, and it's, just a, it's just a riotous thing that happens and, and Moses comes down at the prompting of God and says that, that the, the noise I hear is not the noise of war but of reveling. Moses comes down with the, ten, the original Ten Commandments, sees what the people are doing and smashes down signifying that Israel had already, before they even received the Ten Commandments, had broken all ten. Instead of the glory of God changing them, they began to despise the glory of God and see it as mundane and ordinary. Moses meets with God and the people still grumble against Moses. I wonder who the right leader is and God's, Moses says, well, let's let God figure it out. And he meets with God and he says, this is what's going to happen. All you people, you're going to have your censors. You're going to stand, all your, all your leaders in rebellion, you're going to stand at your tent door with your censors. And we're going to see who God decides to lead the people. And on that day, Korah's rebellion ends in destruction as the earth opens up and swallows him. And 72 other leaders of Israel are burnt to ash. And the people rebel against Moses' leadership. <clears throat> See the glory of God, but nothing changes inside. There's a little external fear. Stinks to be those guys. But I'm not really going to respect Moses' leadership because I have my own free will. I can do what I want. Moses' face is shining. People are freaked out by his shining face. They want him 
and cover his face with a veil because they can't stand, they can't bear to look at the glory of God even reflected in the face of Moses. You would think that that would keep them from sin, but it doesn't. It becomes mundane. They get used to it. The glory of God. Oh, boring. We need excitement. The Shekinah glory fills the tabernacle. You'd think it'd keep them from sinning, but it doesn't. How about the filling of the most holy place in the, in the temple? Things have got to have changed by then. 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 5 through 11. put inside the most holy place. Verse 5 of 1 Kings 8 and King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who had assembled before him were with him before the ark sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. Then the priests brought the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place in the inner sanctuary of the house in the most holy place underneath the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread out their wings over the place of the ark so that the cherubim overshadowed the ark and its poles. And the poles were so long that the ends of the poles were seen from the holy place before the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from outside. And they are there to this day, meaning that day that this was written. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of stone that Moses had put there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And when the priests came out of the holy place, the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. The, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. You would think that that awesome experience would have kept them from sinning. You would think that Solomon, who spoke with God and God spoke with him, and had this awesome experience, would have been kept from sinning. But he, he didn't keep it didn't keep him from sinning. He went right on sinning. And we find that the God declaration of Solomon at the end of his life is that Solomon did evil in the sight of God. I wonder. Church talks a lot about the glory of God. Have you been changed by the glory of God? Or has it become ho hum, yawn? It's not very exciting. The other significant time that we see the glory of God is in the covenant curses on Israel. Covenant curses on Israel. God's glory is seen in the judgment and exile of Israel and Judah and the establishment of the new covenant. See, here's the problem. Before we read that, here's the problem. That the giving of the law, that first significant event in which we see the glory of God and in which Paul is referencing in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, that giving of the law never changes people. See, because it's just rules. They are, they are wonderful rules given by God Himself. Yeah, there's rules. Kind of be nice if we obeyed them, but it's okay. We, we know that everybody sins, so don't get all worried about the Ten Commandments. That's 
old school. New school is God is love. That is, he is love. But that idea, that, that tweaking is from the enemy to keep people from being born again. Because the purpose of the law, and a lot of people say, well, if you ask them, how do you plan to get to heaven? Well, if they believe in heaven, I'm trying to be a good person. Upon what basis? But A, the subject, subjective basis, um, I'm not like so-and-so, or it's I'm trying to obey the Ten Commandments, which is an absolute impossibility. Israel had the Ten Commandments. They had the law. And they failed to live it. They saw, and they, and their history was that they saw the glory of God. Not, not just in these times, but there are many other times that they saw the glory of God. But these significant times in their history, they saw the glory of God. And it made a momentary impact in them as a nation. But quickly, they fell away. Jeremiah chapter 29. If you'll turn there. Jeremiah 29. Verses 17 through 19. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I am sending on them sword famine, and pestilence. And I will make them like vile figs that are so rotten they cannot be eaten. I will pursue them with sword, famine, and pestilence, and will make them a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth to be a curse, a terror, a hissing, and a reproach among all the nations where I have driven them because they did not pay attention to my words, declares the Lord. What kind of words? That I persistently sent you, sent to you by my servants, the prophets, but you would not listen, declares the Lord. The history of the nation of Israel, and turn back to Exodus, we'll give you this little background to Exodus chapter 19. Not in your notes, but Exodus 19, um, in the verse 2 on down through uh, verse 4, 5, 6, um, there Israel came before the mountain, verse 3, while Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, here's, here's the covenant. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant and promise to make you into a great nation, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the people of Israel. And in God's covenant with the nation of Israel, they were to be His kingdom people. They were to be His covenant people. And, and only believers become covenant people of God. Inside the nation, there was this mix of believer, unbeliever. And though the men of Israel were circumcised in the flesh. Most of them were not circumcised in heart. They 
see the glory of God. They heard God speak. They'd seen the mountain. They'd witnessed his miraculous wonders. And there was no change inside. See, a lot of people say, oh man, if God would just do a miracle today, people would believe. No, they wouldn't. Because they can't. Because outward signs don't change inward things, issues. Can't do it. Israel had all the signs. Israel had the promises. Israel had the covenants. Israel had the law. Israel had the prophets. Israel had everything that God could give them except they were not as a whole regenerated by the Spirit of God. There were people inside Israel who were true Israel who have always been born again by the Spirit of God. But as a nation, they rejected God. As a nation, they turned their backs on God. And as a nation, God judged them. He sent the Assyrians into the northern ten tribes, decimated them, and the northern ten tribes were wiped out forever, meaning as a nation. He sent the Babylonians into the southern two, two tribes, sent them into exile, and unified the nation of Israel when he brought them back out of the exile in Babylon in, 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 after 70 years of captivity. But they went back on sinning. They went back to their sin. And God says, look, I'm just going to, I'm going to destroy you. Jeremiah chapter 31, shortly after God's promise to destroy them, to judge them, he makes this statement in chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. You, we already read in Exodus 19, beginning at 2 to 3, down God's promise to make them a people of His own. But notice the wording. Verses 31 to 34 of Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke. Though I was their husband, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. And I will write it on their heart. No longer on stone. Now it's on the heart. And I will be their God and they will be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. The new covenant is established in the blood of Jesus Christ. The old covenant was established on stone. It didn't penetrate hearts. Without the Spirit of God, it's just stony words on stony hearts. As we read before, written with a pen of iron and a diamond tip, and they still will not turn. Why? Because the Spirit of God has to, tra has to transform people. The Spirit of God has to regenerate people. The law doesn't regenerate. And anybody who thinks they can get to heaven because they're good enough doesn't understand the purpose of the law. The Ten Commandments can only minister death to sinners. That's their purpose. They can only minister death to sinners. Now, there's still beautiful words. There's still glory in the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue. Why? Let me give you a couple of reasons. First of all, maybe most important, God carved the Decalogue in stone. God carved it. He did it. They're His words. Paul 
Paul says this in verse 7 of chapter 3, 2 Corinthians 3, 7. Now, if the ministry of death, that's the Decalogue, carved in letters on stone. Now, the verse goes on, but understand this point. The Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, is the glory of God revealed in that he wrote it. It's his law. But the law doesn't save. The law brings death. Exodus chapter 24, verse 12. Exodus 24, 12. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, that I may give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. This is the finger of God writing on stone for the people. would you think, you know, people say, I just wish God would sit down and have a chat. I wish, you know, he'd, he'd tell me a letter. I wish I'd get a phone call. In our day and age, I, I, a tweet, an email, it doesn't matter. I, see, he's communicating. He's communicated in his scriptures. How do you do that? Do you love the law? Do you love the word? Or is it just check off if you can read it? How are you doing with the very letter of God to you? The purpose of the law is to bring death. That's a good thing. Paul, in Romans, we're not going to turn there, but Paul says, I would have known what sin was except for the law. And once I knew it, I died. That's the purpose of the law, to bring us to the end of ourselves. Exodus chapter 34, verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, now this is the second giving of the law, cut for yourselves two stone tablets. Like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first, which you broke. That last statement, which you broke, doesn't just mean that he smashed. It means that you violated as a people. See, the purpose of the law is to show us how far from God we are and how glorious He really is. How so superior to us He is and how sinful we really are. In the giving of the law, the glory of God was revealed on Mount Sinai and it could not be gazed upon for fear of being put to death. And if you really, as a, as a person, a human being, outside of Christ, and hopefully those of you in Christ have experienced this, when you really begin to understand how sinful you are, you will begin to despair of yourself. That's why preaching a gospel that is pleasing to people is a false gospel because the gospel must of necessity be offensive because it must drive us to the end of ourselves and only when we're at the end of ourselves will we call out on the Lord and it's His work in us that drives us to the cross. He does it through the commandments. He does it through the law. The Israelites couldn't stand to look on God and his glory for fear of being put to death. This fear of death was first experienced when God revealed his power on the mountain. I mean, as a Christian, I, I look back on that in Scripture and with my mind, I think, man, it would have been awesome to see that. It would have been terrifying to see that. Again, verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 3. Now, if the ministry of death, 
carved in letters on stone came with such glory. It was not a light thing. You remember Uzzah? It's not a gun. Uzzah was behind the oxen cart as it hauled the, the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem and David is leading it and, and he thinks he's doing right. The oxen stumble, the cart's about to tip. Uzzah's afraid that the, the Ark of the Covenant's going to fall out. He, he fall off. He reaches out, he touches it and immediately he dies. Does it like the ark have electricity in it? No, this is God and His holiness. It says, you don't get to approach me any way you want. He is so holy that we must approach God on His terms, not ours. We don't get to figure out and make up our own rules about how we approach Him. We must always approach God on His terms. Uzzah, who was trying to be helpful, reached out and touched that which was more holy than him. And he died. You see, coming in contact, spiritually, coming in contact with the holiness of God kills us. It brings death to us. And that's what Paul's saying. Look, those letters carved in stone, they only minister death. Again, verse 7. Now, if the ministry of death carved in letters of stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not look on the face of Moses or Moses' face because of its glory, which was beginning or being brought to an end. Moses represented God to the people, but he represented death to the people as God's face was, God's glory was reflected in Moses' face. Exodus chapter 20, verses 18 and 19. Exodus 20, 18 and 19. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flash of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen. <laughs> really? But don't let God speak to us lest we die. That is a hard heart. That's a hard heart. Moses, you just tell us what God wants and we'll surely obey you. But we're afraid we're going to die if we speak to God. Yes, you need to die. Spiritually, you need to understand how sinful you really are, how separated from God you really are, and only looking at the glory of God in the law brings you to the end of yourself. Otherwise, you go through life thinking, I'm pretty special. Look at me. As if somehow you woke up today by your own will. As if somehow today you were able to dress yourself of your own will. Take that last breath of your own will. Have that next heartbeat of your own will. Do what you're going to do of your own will. You only exist by the will of God. And until you come to realization, you're not all that. Only when you come to that realization and see yourself for who you really are in the law of God, only then do you begin to despair of yourself. Fear was next revealed when the glory of God was, was seen reflected in the face of Moses. Verse 7. Now if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze on, on at Moses' face because of its glory which is being brought to an end. Exodus 34, if you'll turn there. Exodus 34. Verses 29 to 35. Exodus 
Exodus 34, 29 to 35, when Moses came down from, the mount, from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face, face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them and Aaron, and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him. Apparently they started moving away. They returned to him. And Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with them on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. When Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what, uh, what he had commanded, in verse 35, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses and the skin of Moses' face was shining. And Moses put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. The people should have said, we have an awesome God. We are so undeserving of even being called a people of God. We are so undeserving of having God's special attention on us that He would bless us and bring us out of slavery and bring us to the promised land and point us to the promised land. But they didn't. They said, Moses, we want you to put a veil over your face. You cannot handle looking at the glory of God. Scott Hafman in the NIV application commentary on 2 Corinthians said this, and I, I think this is so, uh, so true. The veil not only preserves Israel from being destroyed, it also keeps her from being transformed. See, when, when you do this to God, when you want God not to speak to you, what you're saying is, I don't want to be transformed. It's, you're putting yourself away from God. We're going to get to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 when we'll read that the veil is still over their face. God's, God's glory wasn't meant to destroy, but to purify and keep Israel from sin. That was the purpose. It was to purify her and to keep her from sinning. The law tells us what God's requirements are. In verse 20, Moses said to the people, Do not fear. Don't be afraid. Don't freak out. For God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. But what happens is when, when we take God's word, God's law, which is written in stone, and we say, look, I, let's remove it. We don't want to hear it. We don't want to see it. We're going to claim this false separation of church and state. We're going to, we don't want God to speak to us even through the, the Ten Commandments. What they're really saying is, I don't want to be transformed. I don't want God to speak to me. I'm happy the way I am. Here's why they're happy. And here's why you aren't, who aren't in Christ are happy the way you are. You have a gaze into the glory of God. Ignorance is not bliss. When you gaze into the glory of God, when you see Him for who He is, when you see yourself for who you are, you will despair of yourself. And you will call out to the Lord. The glory of God reflected in the face, in Moses' face, was veiled. To signify the destructive power of God on sinners who refuse to obey His law. 
Joshua loved the Lord. He stood by Moses. He stood by the tabernacle. He wasn't freaked out by God. Why? It wasn't because he was not part of the people. It was because he had the Spirit of God within him that gave him the ability to see himself for who he was and love the Lord. Israel had the law. They had God's special working in their midst. They, they saw God's power in the nation of Israel and how he killed the firstborn. They had the opportunity to go into the promised land. Nexus 33, 3. We read, God said, Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. But I will not go in among you, lest I consume you on the way. For you are a stiff necked people. Have you seen the glory of God? Do you still resist His will? Do you still have a plan for your life? Or are you willing to submit to God's plan for your life? Verse 5 of Exodus 33. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. Wow. Why is this important? Because Paul is going to bring in the new God. He's going to introduce the gospel of grace in Jesus. Who fulfilled the law. Took our punishment for breaking the law. So that we could be made righteous with God. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, your savior you, you're either stiff-arming God and saying, I can handle life myself. Just think too well of yourself because you haven't really looked at the, at the scriptures and seen how evil the heart of man is. Only in Christ will you find the glory of God and not be afraid. Would you stand with me? Father, well, so thank for the glory of God. We're so thank for that peace of God that passes understanding that's found in Christ that keeps our hearts and our minds and, and Lord while we are brought to despairing of ourselves because of your law and we are law breakers we find peace not because of anything that we have done but because of what you have done for us through Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself up for us. I pray, Father, that if there are any here today who've been stiff-arming you, who still have the veil over their face so they can't see the glorious gospel of Christ, I pray that you would remove that veil. That they might see who they are in desperate need of a Savior. I praise you, Father, You desire salvation for sinners. May we love you and serve you. Not because we are worthy to serve you, but because you have made us worthy through Christ. We'll praise you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior.